Hi everybody, and welcome to Lecture 10 of Digital VLSI Design. I'm Dr. Adam Thiemann of bar Ilan University. Today I'll be discussing input-output circuits and the pad ring. So let's start actually with a bit about packaging. How do we actually get outside the chip? Well, it's a pretty long road. We have I.O. circuits on the chip that go into bonding wires that then go into the package and finally make it to the board and that's what gets us outside the chip. And once we get outside the chip, we have long wires. Long wires mean a lot of delay, a lot of capacitance, and a lot of inductance. It's a different order of magnitude than what we're used to from inside the chips. Um, one thing, we can use fatter wires and that way get low resistance, and we have a lot more room to play around with than we do inside the tight chip. The interface between the chip and the outer world is the IC package, which we can see here, where we have our piece of silicon over here and all the connection to some sort of a substrate, which is this uh, type of green piece here, this type of small board. Um, we have these bond wires, for example. We have the bonding pad, and we probably have some sort of a mold that keeps everything in place. So. What is this package? It sounds like kind of a trivial type of a thing, but actually it's very important and, and it may be in fact one of the most expensive pieces of the whole uh, product in the end. So the package provides the physical temperature and electrical protection for the chip. Um, it's the electrical connection from the chip to the board. So we need to go from the chip and arrive to the rest of the system through this package. It's the physical connection, it actually what connects it physically, and it protects us from high voltages that are outside the chip. It gives us physical protection so we don't accidentally break the chip if we touch it or something like that. And it provides um, thermo isolation, which is a very important piece that we'll discuss. Um, here we can have a type of a schematic of a package with all kinds of pieces of RLC that we have um, connecting to it. The requirements of the, the package have five different categories. First of all, electrical. We need to discuss the capacitance, resistance, inductance, and impedance tuning of all the connections to the chip. We have the interface, so we want a large number of I.O. pins often to connect to different uh, interfaces outside the chip. We have the mechanical um, type of a requirement, which is what type of protection we have for both the die itself and the bonds that connect the die to the outside world, and how it is compatible with the underlying um, PCB that we have to connect to. We have the thermal requirements, which are how do we remove heat from the chip. That's a very important part. And we have the cost. Again, the the um, cost of a system is going to be very dependent on the package. The package is a very uh, su substantial figure in that, and we want it to be as low as possible. Um, it, it, giving good thermal protection will let us deal without a fan or a heat sink or so forth, and that can also um, lower the overall cost of our system. So we're going to start to discuss how the package itself connects to the board. This is already outside the chip, but it's an important part of this whole discussion. So the original type of a uh, package that was used, and it's the cheapest type of package you can get, is called the DIP, the dual inline package, and variations on it. Each type of these packages that I'm going to show, there are dozens, maybe more standards that you can buy that are similar to it. And this, as you can see, has two rows of these types of pins. Um, they often call this uh, in Hebrew a juke, which means like a bug because it kind of looks like a little um, cockroach or something, this type of a package. And these little um, pins, they stick into holes in the board. And then you put some solder on the back of them and that's it, how it connects to the board and holds it in. But as you can see, this type of a package has only uh, a relatively low number of pins. It's also a, a, a kind of a, a rectangular shape rather than something square, which may be more um, useful. And um, this type of a package only had 16 pins, so you can only make 16 connections outside the chip. And therefore, it's, uh, it's very limited in its, uh, in its I.O. bandwidth. Um, a more kind of a complex package is the what we would call a QFP or a quad flat package and it's a type of families. And here we have a, a already a square uh, package with uh, many of these types of pins. The pins are also sort of bent so it's easier to uh, put the solder on them and so forth. Um, as you can see the difference would be that in here you would have a chip like this that would be connected 
to uh, these guys in such a way and on the other side too and here you would have the chip in the middle here that's connected now to all of these guys and we have a lot more pins in this case but still we have to in the end solder each one of these pins separately to the board and uh, which could take quite a bit of work and uh, it has these long um, connections that have to be bonded inside which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, a, a more um, kind of complex package is what we call a PGA or a pin grid array. And here on the board, we would have holes in an array. So if we would take our board, it would have a bunch of these holes in it. And we can just stick the, uh, this, flip this package over and stick it in and all the pins will stick right into where we, um, we pre-drilled these pins and then we have to just put solder on the other side. Um, inside here, of course, we have the chip, which is now uh, routed to all of these pins and we can get a lot more pins in this way. Um, uh, so this is a bit better uh, arrangement. And finally, we have what we call a BGA or a ball grid array, which is similar in how it's set up to this PGA. But here, instead of these holes on the board, what we would have is we would have kind of uh, landing pads on the board, these types of places that we just flip this thing over, put it on, and there's uh, some material here that once we heat up the, the board in the package, we uh, these balls will melt and they will cause this connection to happen. So we don't have to go and solder each one of these, but rather we can um, just do one type of a thermal uh, process that will connect everything at once and that's much more um, efficient than, than doing it one by one. So a ball grid array is what's used for things with a lot of pins and uh, that we want to do it more uh, effectively but of course the price goes like this right so these will be a lot more expensive. But that's outside the chip so that's how the chip the, the, the package itself connects to the board. We also have to look how the package connects to the chip. And so uh, there are two main approaches to this. The traditional one um, is called wire bonding. This is what was done for many, many years, and it's still done with the uh, cheaper chips that don't need as special um, uh, requirements. But what we have here basically is that we take the die, we put it on some sort of a uh, solder or something here, uh, that it can be held on to and then we will um, put a little uh, we will put a solder here we will solder a piece of usually gold then tie this gold over to the connection that uh, that pin that we saw before like uh, on our QFP um, and we'll put another solder over here so if we look at this in a microscope we can see here that there's a piece of solder over here and on the other side as well uh, over there there will be another piece of solder and this is really a very thin gold wire um, that, that, that makes the connection. Um, all the pins have to be around the chip edges which uh, we have about a hundred micron pitch it can be lower than that but it's on the uh, order of magnitude of uh, dozens maybe a hundred micron um, we have to bond each one of these chips we have this sewing machine kind of thing that goes and it bonds this side then bonds this side then on the next pin bonds the two sides so this happens really fast, but it still happens one by one, and uh, there's, the machine has to do this. Um, and and the, the, the result is that we have this long wire, and if you see this the wire is long, means it has a high RLC. So it's about five nano hen henries and one picofarad per wire, which is quite a bit um, outside the chip. So that's a uh, wire bonding. It's the cheap way of doing it. It's what's usually done. But again, it takes a lot of time and it, it turns out that we have large parasitics on the wires. The other option is to use what we call a flip chip. And it's called a flip chip because what we do is we take the chip and put on the top of it um, these things called solder bumps. And then we flip the chip over, we turn it over like this and put it on the substrate. Um, and then we just heat up the substrate and uh, the, the solder bumps will be connected. So in that way, it's just like a BGA. The only difference is that now the solder bumps are on the uh, chip itself. So this is the, the IC and um, the, uh, the array here of uh, these package pads, they're on the package itself. Okay. Um, underneath this, there will be routing usually to other balls that will 
uh, have solder bumps under here that will connect to the board, to the PCB. So this, this thing is the substrate of the package. This is the substrate of the package. And, um, and this is the IC itself. Okay, um, so um, what's good about that? So first of all, we can have our actual connections, these balls, they connect to the actual metal inside our chip, uh, to our back end, our high uh, metals of our back end uh, uh, process. And so they're direct connections that, that enable us to connect to the middle of the chip. Here, on, uh, with, the, with the bond pads, with the wire bonding, we could only connect to the, the edges. So if the bond pads, all of the bumps were around the chip and they had to connect outside here with the flip chip, we can actually stick these bonds right in the middle. And that's really good. Why is it good? It's good for several reasons, but it, we can have signals come in directly into the middle of the chip, but even better yet, we can put connections to power and ground wherever we want inside the chip and we don't have to have the long route from like for instance if we had here we uh, put in some sort of a uh, VDD it would have to route all the way to here to get the VDD to a transistor that would be in the middle of the chip here we can put the the, the VDD right on top of it um, the other thing is we don't have these long wires right and so we get these short uh, wires these they're just these bumps and uh, we get uh, a much, much lower um, uh, inductance. So it's like 0.1 nano Henry. Um, another thing is it's really quick, right? We just take the chip, put it on top of the substrate, heat it up, and everything is connected rather than connecting all these pins at once. Um, another thing is that I, I just didn't mention a second ago is that Beforehand, we had everything around the edges. That means that we could only use the periphery of the chip to make these bonds, and we had our, our pitch, which I said was a few do dozen microns, even up to 100 microns pitch between them. Here, we can put these all over the place. So we use the whole area of the chip. We can get many, many, many more pins versus uh, the wire bonding process. Okay, this is all great, but it's really expensive. Um, it costs much more to both plan these uh, chips and to um, pack and, and to buy the package itself. Okay, so just when you take a wire bond, which is something that we often do in academia because uh, the, the flip chips are so much more expensive to, to ramp up and to make, um, we're going to do a lot of wire bonding. And that's also true for maybe a lot of embedded products that, that don't have as high uh, bandwidth needs and can deal with a smaller number of uh, peripherals. So what we have to make sure is, remember, we have these pads around the chip, these IOs, which we'll be discussing in a minute, and they have these bonds that connect to the uh, the connections that are on the inside of the package. And these become these long wires. They have some sort of an angle. And we have to make sure that none of the wires cross. Like if I wanted to take this, oops, if I wanted to take this guy over to here and take this guy over to here, we would have crossing wires. And uh, as whoever's seen Ghostbusters knows, you're not allowed to cross the streams. Okay, we have to have some sort of minimum spacing in this way. And of course, uh, between these guys too. And we can't have uh, too big an angle of wires. So if our bond was here, we probably couldn't take it to the corner over here because the angle becomes too big. And we also get too long a wire there. Um, for example, if we make a chip that's really small and we have this long wire, it also may not meet the DRC rules of the package. So these are all um, some of the requirements of bond bond wires. Just I want to make a short summary here because often uh, I find out that so, sometimes we lose things in the context. So um, remember, we have our IC, which is our little chip. And around the chip, we're going to put, and I'll discuss in a minute, these um, bond pads, which are pieces of metal, but they're in, in the back end uh, of the chip. So these are like a top metal layer um, that that is open. It's uh, not covered by some sort of a uh, passivation that blocks the, the outside world. Then we come and we take a package substrate. So that's a some sort of a piece of plastic or something that uh, we put the chip on. We'll usually glue it onto that. And um, that has its own types of these uh, landings around um, on the inside part of on the interior part of it. OK, all of these landings around will be each connected to a little pin, right, that, as we saw before, that goes out to the board itself. So what we need to do now is we need to connect the chip 
to the package. So how are we going to do that? We're going to take a piece of gold. We're going to solder it over here and pull it over to here and solder it over here. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, and same we're going to do for each and every one of these. That's the wire bonding process. Now we're going to take this package. Okay. We're going to also uh, put some mold on top of it. So everything will be held in place. These very thin wires won't ever move and so forth. It'll be protected from our fingers. There'll be a top on the package, which will uh, be some sort of a heat sink and be able to dissipate um, uh, dissipate heat and so forth. So this we're going to all put onto our board. This is our big PCB. Okay. This thing we'll usually call the substrate of the package. Okay. And this guy will be the IC. Okay. So now we have our big PCB, which may have other chips on it and who knows what. Um, and these guys, we're going to actually solder all of these pins in either again if it was like a QFP package we'd uh, make a solder on it if it was like a dip package we'd have a hole that this thing would fit through um, if it was a, 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 a grid array then uh, it could be a hole ones with the holes or the ones with the landing um, with heating it up if it was a BGA or a PGA um, and then these guys are going to be routed on the board to other places that they need to go Okay, um, those routes will be already built into the, the PCB. So um, we discussed these two types of connections, the connections from the chip to the package substrate and from the substrate to the board. I just want to also mention that these package substrates are pretty much standardized. So other than the flip chips, which will be made per product, there are different, uh, you can go online and buy a, a number of thousand of these packages that they'll already be set to a certain size and so forth and then uh, the bonding houses will figure out how to um, make the connections from the chip to these packages that already exist so that was just a summary of our first part about packaging okay we'll now move on to the second part of our lecture today which is discussing the actual input output or io circuits okay so we discussed up till now the package, how it connects to the board and how it connects to the chip, but how do we interface to the package itself? Okay, we need to create a physical connection to the bonding wire. Okay, so when we talk about bonding wires, what we do is we have this thing called a landing pad. Okay, the landing pad is this thing here. It has to be big enough that with a machine that is in, uh, in, real life types of sizes and not nanometers will be able to come and stick a piece of wire here and bond it so it has to be pretty big so big i mean it has to be about a uh, hundred micron or they can go down to maybe 50 micron or so but um, the, the smaller they are that means that the process is more expensive and you're going to be paying the bonding house more to actually connect these things okay and it, it gets more fragile it gets more complicated and so forth Okay, what um, we actually do here is if we take our, uh, if our chip, looking at a cross section of it, we have, you know, all our contacts and metals and contacts and metals and so forth. What we're going to do is we're going to put big stacks of these contacts and metals. So when this actual sewing machine type of pin comes and bonds the wire, it doesn't just push through and break our whole chip. So usually we're going to have at least like about four metal layers uh, on top of each other. Uh, um, on this uh, just to make this thing you it, it will be given to you by um, the package house or the foundry as a GDS that uh, you just instantiate this type of bonding wire which is just uh, a bunch of a big piece of metal with a whole bunch of vias under it a whole array of vias and then another piece of metal in the next metal down and that's also covered with vias and another piece of metal down that's what it is it's just that's the bonding pad Okay, for flip chip uh, packaging, it's a bit different. We don't have this uh, physical um, type of a pin that comes and hits our chip and can break these real thin uh, layers that we have. It's, it, it's just this solder bump that we heat it up. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, leave this area that's kind of open inside our chip. Uh, the rest is going to be covered with this stuff called passivation, which uh, protects the, the top metal layers from, from the outside world. So we're going to leave it open. Here too, this is all covered with passivation. And here there'll be a, oops, sorry. Uh, this is going to be 
uh, everything outside is going to be covered with passivation. This is going to be open so we can actually do the connection. So here, all of this is going to be uh, covered with passivation. This is going to be open for the connection. And then we have to put a bunch of layers inside here, which allow us to make a good connection. And then they're going to stick this uh, solder bump on or a ball, they sometimes call them, uh, which then we can uh, put it onto the substrate, which has a uh, landing area on it and heat it up and this ball will melt and cover this whole area and make both a physical and an electrical connection to it. Okay, um, how do we get to the bumps? We have a, an extra layer, a top layer, which is usually an aluminum type of a, um, of a connection called RDL or redistribution layer. As you can see in this very small uh, flip chip, you have these weird types of routes that go and they're a top layer that route from uh, like the top layer. There's a via that goes to this RDL and can connect to these different um, uh, uh, bumps, these, uh, these bump openings. Okay, but what is it actually underneath that connects to the bonding pads? Because all we've been talking about right now has been these metal pieces, right? These interconnect layers. So we have something that we call IO circuits, input-output circuits. What are the requirements of IO circuits? Well, there are lots of them, okay? Um, we have to be able to drive big loads. Remember that now we have in the, in the package, we have these long wires, they're transmission lines. They have these big RLCs. It's not like what a regular uh, little transistor, a little inverter uh, drives. So we have to do something else to be able to drive these big loads that are in, in a different level. Um, second of all, we have to have voltage consistency. Remember that uh, a lot of our, um, our off-chip uh, uh, devices have different voltages that are on the board. We're talking about voltages around one volt or even lower in our chips today when we have different things that work at 5 volts or 3.3 volts or different types of uh, levels like that, and we have to be able to drive them. We have to have low switching noise. So again, we have um, these transmission lines that have inductance. These are uh, these wires are transmission lines with inductance. We have a lot of uh, um, current, and we have to make sure that we don't have noise doing that. And we have ESD. So if uh, you guys have ever walked on a carpet before and then touched something, sometimes you get this like shock. Well, that's all this um, charge being um, discharged from your body, and that can get to uh, uh, hundreds, even thousands of volts, which will easily burn out uh, a transistor. So we have to make sure that when you something actually touches um, the one of the pins and discharges all that charge into the chip, it has to be um, it has to not burn out our, our very little tiny transistor. So that's called ESD, electrostatic discharge, and we'll be discussing that. So just as a, a kind of a, a, a bunch of bullet points about that, the goals of IO design is to reduce the delay to and from the outside world, um, have high drive current capability, match the impedance to the load, have ESD protection, um, level shift the voltages, in other words, take the, the, the low voltages inside and turn them into big voltages outside or opposite, meet the specifications of the different interfaces that we have to talk to, and we have to reduce uh, power. We have these big output buffers, which we'll discuss, and we don't want to have any short circuit running through them. And finally, we have to be able to deal with high voltages if we have some sort of an EA, ESD or um, or large voltages that we need to drive like 3.3 volts or 5 volt which uh, our usual transistors aren't able to deal with so these are all goals that we have to deal with in io design which makes it a very complex thing even though logically uh, it's very simple we're just uh, designing a kind of a buffer so here's a short taxonomy of our types of IO cells. So we usually get this IO library similar to a standard cell library, right? But we get an I a library of IOs. There may be uh, several libraries of IOs that we're going to use. And um, so the standard ones, which we're going to get, um, uh, are what we're going to be discussing now. And they're basically divided into three digital, analog, and power pads. There are all kinds of special cells for special types of um, interfaces, but I'm not going to go into them here. So uh, what do we have? The digital I.O. buffers, the ones over here, what do they do? They provide high drive uh, 
uh, up level shifting output so they need to drive the outputs um, the outputs are these big wires we need to be able to fill them with, uh, with uh, quickly with their charge and they need to provide down level shifting and ESD protection for input so when we put an input into it we need to provide uh, we need to turn the outside voltage into the internal digital voltage and we have to make sure that we're not going to burn out any circuits due to electrostatic discharge so those are digital IO buffers analog IO cells um, what they're going to do is they're going to be some sort of wire that can allow an analog uh, voltage to go to and from the chip but they also need to provide some sort of ESD protection so we don't burn out the chip and we have to have power supplies so these are um, what's going to actually bring the VDD and ground into the into the chip and they also provide the basis for the ESD protection so we're going to discuss all of that now in the coming slides so let's start with our digital IO buffers. And here on the right, you can see a schematic of what we usually get. Um, I will say that there are IO buffers that are only inputs or only outputs, but often we just get one um, circuit that provides either input or output. Okay, so what we have often is a one of the connections on the circuit is called pad. It may be called something else in your library, but the pad is where we actually take our big piece of metal with all the vias that we discussed before and connect it over to here. So that's what connects to the outside world. If this connects to the outside world, then going this way would be an input circuit and going that way would be an output circuit. So as an input circuit, um, there's no problem that we're actually driving some sort of a, a level to the input. Um, so what comes here will always have this available as an input. Um, on, the, on the other hand, as an output, it is important that if we're driving an input, it doesn't cause some sort of a contention upon this line. So for outputs, we have a special output enable signal that will turn on or off this output uh, driver, depending on if we're using the pad as an input or an output. So when we're using it as an output, we'll, put, we'll turn on this output enable, and then whatever comes here will be driven out to here, and it will also be fed back so we can also look at what we're uh, driving if we if we need to okay so this is the basic circuit uh, we have we have two buffers one going from the internal um, voltage of the, the the digital layer that's the DN will be on like our digital VDD right our internal VDD and the output voltage will be on some sort of IO VDD which will usually be higher so there's an upshift over here and on the other side we come here we have some sort of downshift where we're talking about the IO VDD going into a digital VDD on this side okay and again what we have to do is we have to select output enable to enable this or else we're gonna turn this into a tri-state and cut it off if this is being used just as an input um, for this we need to get four voltages we need to get our VDD our digital VDD we need to get because that's what feeds this side and this side of our drivers um, we need to have the the IO VDD which serves this and this side of the drivers and we have to have uh, a digital and an IO VSS sometimes these are shorted together usually these are separate voltages and cannot be shorted together so remember that this output driver it needs to drive picofarads Usually inside chips, we've been talking about femtofarads. That's uh, three orders of magnitude difference, which means that we need these really, really, really big transistors to drive that thing. And yes, this thing is just a buffer. But how do we make this buffer? We use an inverter chain, uh, these growing inverters. And finally, the final stage will be huge. It will be very, very huge. And you can see it in our layout below that these are just, these things are huge. These are very big. Um, and as you can see the, the the area here in whatever process this uh, picture was taken from they, these are these are mini 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 transistors that are parallel to each other um, uh, doing this uh, type of a, a, a driving okay these it's just this thing is one transistor or, or several transistors that are uh, just a small inverter chain okay um, we have parts for ESD protection we have um, parts for JTAG which I'm not uh, discussing here and uh, we have some resistors which we'll discuss in a second okay you can see that in general we have this um, type of a, a more complex schematic which will have other things for example um, the pull up and pull down resistors which uh, will enable us to have things float if they're not uh, to, to make sure they're not floating in case they're not connected okay um, one thing is that since we have these huge 
uh, see these really, really big transistors, we need to make sure there's no short circuit current because if there's a spot where we have, you know, both the NMOS and the PMOS open, we're going to have this current that's uh, ridiculous that's going through the transistors. So what we'll usually do is we'll give an enable signal that will not be overlapped in order to turn off um, uh, one of the, uh, both of the pull up and pull down before turning on the other one. Okay, so that's another important thing in a digital buffer. When we look at the um, uh, using the buffer as an input, we have to take into account this uh, ESD protection, this electrostatic discharge. So electrostatic discharge is really one of the most important reliability problems in the IC industry. Often when you go to, to test circuits and to work uh, in the lab, you'll be grounded um, because of this. But um, uh, again, we're going to be selling these things all over the place. They're also going to be interacting with all kinds of machines. And we need to make sure that if any charge comes in, it's not going to cause a high voltage that's going to burn out the chip. Okay, so how we do that is we use something called a diode clamp. Okay, so this is our pad and we're looking at the input. So in the end, there's some sort of a trans uh, of an inverter or uh, a bunch of transistors here that are, are going to be in. And if a large voltage comes and hits this gate, it's going to just uh, break down both of these gates. So we can't allow that to happen. So what we do is we stick these diode clamps uh, on uh, on the on the, the, the line here. And what that means is if we get a really high voltage, like a thousand volts or something like that, it's going to turn on this um, resistor, which or this diode, which is usually uh, uh, which is usually in a uh, reverse bias because here we have a VDD and here we have a ground, right? So it's usually a reverse bias diode, but if we all of a sudden get this voltage spike that goes above VDD, 0.7 above VDD, we're going to turn it on and all of the charge, instead of reaching uh, the gate here and burning it out, it's going to be discharged through here. So, uh, s similarly, if we get this minus 1000 volts or actually minus VDD uh, minus 0.7 volts, um, it's going to turn on this guy and uh, it's going to discharge the current through the um, this diode. Okay, so those are those uh, diodes that we have here. And we also will have this resistor that's a current limiting resistor, which will also take part of the voltage on it. It's a very small resistor that's in series. We don't usually like resistors in series with things, but um, we put it here because it'll, it'll take some of the voltage while the ESD is being uh, claimed by these guys. In fact, usually we don't do this in one step. We usually use what we call a primary ESD and a secondary ESD. So the primary ESD will be this really big diodes, but really big diodes take a long time to turn on. So we'll have, after our current limiting resistor, a secondary ESD element, which is a much smaller diode that can turn on fast and provide protection for the, the short amount of time until the primary ESD can, uh, can take care of all this current. Okay, um, the diodes are made with uh, P diffusions in, in N wells or N diffusions in P substrate, and the resistors are made from either diffusion or polysilicon. So that was a digital cell, um, both as an input and an output. Um, but what about the analog IO cells? So if you need to have some sort of an analog voltage, you'll have a, a, an analog cell in your library. And basically, in an analog cell, we don't want to put a digital buffer or something to turn uh, some sort of analog voltage into a zero or one. So we, what we need is a wire. So we go from the pad from the bonding pad into the uh, into the internal part of the chip. And maybe we have some sort of a very, very small metal resistor. We don't want to put anything big because it'll ruin our voltage, but at least to, to take some of the uh, some of the voltage in case we have one of these ESD um, things. Um, what we need to do is we need to add ESD clamps uh, to these things. Uh, it, tends to be more complicated than the standard digital way, but uh, that's out of the scope of this uh, talk. So basically it's just a wire, okay? And finally, we have the power uh, supply cells and how they uh, provide this ESD protection. So again, the power supply cells, similar to the analog pads, they're, they're, um, they're just a wire that connects VDD or ground into the chip. But it's not only that, because what we do usually is in our pad ring, if we're talking about a wire bonded design or a design with the IOs on the periphery, what we'll do is we'll provide these rings all around the chip. 
that will have the different voltages, VSS, VDD, VSS IO, and VDD IO, those four voltages we need in each pad. That way, if I take some sort of a pad and I stick it over here, it will be able to get all the voltages it needs, similar to the way that inside the chip we provide VDD and ground for any standard cell. We just stick this here and it can take uh, tap these four voltages. Okay, so um, what we need to do with the power pins, the power uh, IOs, is we need to stick our power IO here, and let's say this is a VDD one, so VDD is this blue color here, so it has to have a short to um, this rail here, and then it will provide power all around the chip. Okay, um, and then next to it we might have a VSS one that will have a short to this red wire, and there we'll have a VDD IO one, and it will short to the um, purple wire, okay? So we're gonna have to have a bunch of these all over the place. Uh, how many of them do we need? Well, it depends on the current we need inside the chip that will, uh, each of these uh, power pads will be able to supply a certain amount of current. So we need to see what our, power, our current dissipation for the whole chip is and provide VDD VSS pads accordingly. And um, we'll discuss in a minute how we d decide what we have to have for the IO um, supplies. Okay, so that so the one thing they do is they provide this um, VDD and VSS that goes into these rings. Second of all, uh, we'll need the VDD and VSS inside the chip. So these power rails, let's say this one is VDD and this one is VSS, they need to somehow connect to um, this guy and this guy. Often what we'll do is we'll, as we discussed before, we'll put another ring inside because these things are um, are buried inside the left of our um, of, of our pads and we can't really uh, connect to them so what we'll often do is we'll put another ring around that this guy will connect to here and this guy will connect to here because there'll be a pin here that we'll be able to connect to um, but in general we don't necessarily need it because we actually have these rings inside um, and you can also sometimes need to tap the VSS IO or VDD IO uh, if you need a higher voltage inside the cell and there'll be usually a special uh, library cell to do that okay um, so uh, that's that's basically what we do with these uh, um, uh, with these IOs, but they also provide our uh, our our ESD protection. So remember that in each uh, of these digital IOs, right, we have to have uh, we have our pad signal that goes in, and in the end here we have uh, some sort of a regular inverter, and we don't want this thing to be burned out. So what we need to do is we need to add these two. Um, diodes well where uh, and they have to be connected to a high voltage on one side and a low voltage on the other side so how are we going to do that we're going to have uh, diodes inside this io cell and uh, um, we're gonna since we have the rails all of these four rails inside we can just connect the top of the diode to vdd io the bottom of the diode to vss io and we'll have actually pairs of these diodes to all of the different uh, uh, power rails. So to VDD, VSS, VDD IO, and VSS IO. Um, of course, we have to watch out if we have all kinds of uh, analog voltages or special negative voltages and so forth. Um, it may be detrimental to actually connect the, um, the, uh, the, the ESDs. So you have to make special clamps for that and figure out ways around it. Okay. Um, so that's power supply cells and ESD protection. Simultaneously switching output, or SSO, is a metric that describes the period of time during which switching starts and finishes. So for example, if we have a, a large output bus, like a 64-bit bus, if all of them transition from high to low uh, at the same time, which could be a type of a worst case, a, a very large amount of current must be driven or sunk, uh, which will cause a, a voltage drop because of LDIDT uh, on, on the VDD, on the package, okay? And this is an independent problem of frequency. So when we're gonna have this uh, SSO metric is gonna help us figure out how many IO power supplies are needed, okay? This is, an, there's another thing about that. Well, let's say that uh, VDD and uh, VDD IO were the same voltage or we know that usually VSS and VSSI are the same voltage. We're still going to usually separate them into two separate um, domains. And the reason is that we have our chip, right? And inside we have our core, which is running on one volt or whatever we're having. And it's uh, doing all this stuff. And our 
it's very, very sensitive to little variations in, in noise. We don't want it to drop to half a volt or else our circuit's not going to work. Then again, we have these big guys, and these big guys are going to be driving these huge capacitors outside, and that's going to be a, a big current drop at a certain time, especially if we have simultaneously switched outputs. That means that the, 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 the if we have an inverter here that's driving that, the this guy is going to be very, very noisy. Okay, because of LDITT. So we want to really separate them in any case, both the VDD and the ground, to a separate um, voltage domain than what's driving these guys. So we won't get uh, noise on the digital voltage, even though we have these big switching uh, things happening on the on the IO voltage. So that's why we'll usually separate them in any case. So a few design guidelines for power. We should put as many mutual capacitances as possible between the IC and the voltages. Remember that the way to fight with this LDIDT drop is to put capacitance that will offset it. Um, so a capacitor is basically a storage of charge. So if we have some sort of a, a, a need for current, we can supply that charge uh, directly from a capacitance that's really close. And we discussed that we use decap cells and so forth to put uh, capacitance on, on the chip and so forth. But um, usually these capacitances are very small. Uh, outside the chip, we can put bigger capacitors. So for example, we'll stick um, capacitors all over the place on our uh, on our package. If we have, for example, just a package with all these, uh, like a BGA type of thing with all these bumps, we can just stick capacitors in between these little uh, bumps on the chip. No problem, we can get much bigger capacitors than we had outside. Or if we have our uh, wire bonds or whatever, we can stick capacitors between VDD and ground just to uh, improve the capacitance. We'll have it also on our printed boards and on our voltage regulators. We'll have it everywhere, uh, as much capacitance as we can put. Okay, put as many supply voltage pins as possible. If we have extra pins, why not just add more connections to provide more supply voltages? It will uh, make us have uh, less um, IR drop um, less LDIDT. Um, put supply and ground supply voltages as close as each other as possible. Again, same uh, effect. Provide separate supply voltages for the core and IOs as we discussed before so there won't be noise on the core. Reduce inductances as much as possible by using as short transmission lines as possible. So um, again, outside the chip, these things are going to be transmission lines and uh, the higher the inductance, the harder it is that we'll get more reflections. And uh, usually what we do is we do some sort of uh, impedance um, tuning. So we'll make sure that these IOs, they actually show a 50 ohm impedance. And then all of the test equipment and whatever and anything that connects will also have 50 ohm. And these things will be tuned. And then we won't get reflections. Okay. Um, so that's basically um, what I wanted to say over here. Okay. Um, Another point is what we call pad configurations. So if we're talking about a wire bond and we're talking about pads that are around the periphery, the standard way of doing it is what we call inline pad configuration. So we put these IO cells one next to the other and each IO cell is connected to a bond pad. Okay, again, the bond pad is just a stack of metals that uh, enables us to connect this wire bond. Okay, and they're next to each other, right? And so they're in line with each other. Um, uh, and there's a small gap between them and often the bond pads are wider than the actual IO pad would have to be but that causes uh, I mean the, the, the pitch between the bond pad is usually what drives the whole pitch and uh, obviously the length of each side is how many of these uh, bond pad and uh, IO cell pairs we can put on the side of the chip so it means that we can't put that many on okay to alleviate the problem a little bit, and again, since the, the, the pitch of the bond pad is really set by how uh, we can actually connect our um, wire bond, we can do something which is called staggering. We can take one uh, bond pad, put it underneath the other one, and then we can um, stagger them like that. Um, since the IO cells can be thinner than the actual bond pad, we can get an effective um, width of the IO cells that's like two bond pads or something like that. Um, it costs us a bit in this, the area that's like wasted over here, but we can actually get a, a, a larger number of bond pads and therefore a larger number of interfaces to the chip. So that's called staggered. Um, 
However, it can be even better if we do what we call the CUP or circuit under pad. So in this case, we can design our IO cells that they won't go up too high um, in metals, and then we can stick our bond pad on top of the actual IO cells. So we can do this staggering, if you see the bond pads over here and over here, we can do this staggering on top of the actual um, IO cell and that way we don't have this wasted area that we would have over here that's really wasted just used for the bonding pad and we can save uh, expensive silicon real estate. Of course we have our flip chips and, and flip chip technology. This is a, a kind of irrelevant because we can put our circuits wherever we want, our IO circuits. They don't have to look like this. They don't have to be next to each other. We do have to make sure they're provided with um, the both the uh, IO and uh, core voltages and the, the SD protection. But so often we do put them in areas that they're close to each other. But then again, we can take uh, using this RDL, this redistribution layer, and provide the signals and the power to anywhere, any one of these bumps we have scattered all over the chip. So that's uh, all I wanted to discuss about IOs for right now, and I'm going to stop for a moment uh, to discuss uh, our Chip Hall of Fame for today. So most chips are covered by a package, but if you take certain chips like image sensors, then the package will be um, uh, scraped off because you have to have the uh, silicon exposed to the outside. And here is the first image sensor um, that was uh, commercially sold, which is the Kodak KF1300, and it's a 2017 inductee into the IEEE Hall of Fame. So this is the chip that brought digital photography outside the lab. Um, image sensors were were invented uh, a while before that in the 70s, um, also in Kodak, and they had them. They were used in like um, experiments, lab, and and so forth. But this is the first commercially available um, uh, DSLR was sold with uh, this chip inside it. It was released in 1991. It used a CCD um, technology and it had 1.3 megapixel resolution and that was a big deal. Passing the one megapixel um, uh, barrier enabled making very uh, good resolution pictures that you could actually go and print out. Um, this was sold as a uh, Nikon F3 body where they replaced the film with this image sensor and you had to connect it to this external uh, five kilogram data storage unit and image processing unit um, which you had to carry around with you if you wanted to carry around your digital imager and look at that to buy one of these things the initial price was something around twenty five thousand dollars it went uh, it lowered down to about 20 20 uh, K a bit later on um, it had a 200 megabyte hard disk inside this thing this five kilogram big thing and that could take 156 raw images so you had to carry this thing around on your soldier uh, on your shoulder strap so that's our um, chip hall of fame for today as a final short section i would just like to discuss a little bit about system in package so as soc or system on chip versus system in package what's the difference an SOC or a system on chip is the integration of several IPs on a, on a single silicon substrate. So if we take a, a, a core and some accelerators or some sort of, uh, some sort of different uh, types of protocol and, and so forth and put it on one chip, that's called a system on chip. System in package, on the other hand, or SIP, is where we take several chips, several di separate silicon devices, and we put them all in one single package. So in the example over here, you can see there's this one die, and there are these other dies all around it. And this first die is in, like, for example, in 7 nanometer or 16 nanometer, and the other ones could be in like an older technology. Uh, in this case, not that much older, but a 16 nanometer technology. So why use system in package? Well, there are some clearly obvious uh, understandings. If if we take a chip and we make it really, really big, it, we know that our yield goes up uh, really, uh, our yield goes way down actually to the fourth, right? Uh, something like that. Um, and so what we can see is this size of uh, the chip, the, the yield goes down. When we use a system on package, we can make much smaller dies and then we can use much get much higher yield for our uh, each and every single chip. Okay, 
Second of all, we can mix several process nodes. So in our example here, again, we could have made our logic die with a seven nanometer process to get the highest speed, but maybe our IOs could have been with a, an older process and then they could be cheaper. Or uh, we could use like a, an older technology for analog, such as a more than more type of, a type of approach or so forth. Um, we can also have close integration with non-CMOS devices in that way. Like we can put flash or silicon photonics or silicon germanium or high bandwidth memory, which we'll show at the end of this uh, lecture. So the original approach to this was called MCM, or multi-chip module, and it's, it's uh, something that's very popular still today, but it's been around for a while. Okay, that, that is to actually assemble several silicon devices on one organic substrate. Okay, so uh, what we do here is we have kind of uh, two options. We can either take uh, this substrate, which is like a small package again, and we can have two chips that are both bonded to the same substrate and then package them together. Okay, what it means is that we just get really, really short wires and really close wires and we can do some routing in between them on this substrate and we don't have to go through the larger sizes of uh, the chip. We can also just put these two chips on top of each other and do the bonds, maybe possibly even shorter connections to each other. Um, here we have a routing pitch of about 30 microns and a bump pitch uh, of about 160 microns. And you can here see an example of an AMD um, ATI radon, which has a, a bunch of these um, chips that are all in the same package. This would be uh, the graphic processor, and these are probably DRAM modules. Um, the more... Um, Mature, the more uh, uh, new way of doing this and the better way is what's called a silicon interposer. Okay, in this case, we take several silicon devices and put it, them all on uh, a passive silicon carry. It's basically we're fabricating a package. Okay, so the substrate is a chip. We have um, this silicon interposer, it's a chip. That what it has inside it, it has these different routing tracks that enable us to route from chip to chip. And the silicon carrier um, is assembled on some sort of an organic substrate. And we use TSVs through silicon vias that help us connect between the different chips and the substrate. Okay, so here we can see a picture of this type of a thing. We have a wafer, right? Um, and we take, um, in the wafer we take the silicon interposer is what's actually made on this wafer and then we stick these chips that have been prefabricated onto it and we bond them with these micro micro bumps which are similar to regular bumps on a flip chip and they stick onto the thing and then we can dice the wafer up and we get our system in package over there i mean we get our our, our uh, multiple dies that are already connected to get to each other and then we can package them so this provides us with much more dense bonding than we had with the MCM. We can get a routing pitch of about one micron um, using a, a 65 nanometer um, interposer. Um, of course, the, the 65 nanometer interposer is cheap, much cheaper than like a seven nanometer or a 16 nanometer chip. Okay, we can get these micro bumps that they'll be about 40 microns. Uh, pitch, which is really, really small. Okay, um, we can use regular standard silicon manufacturing equipment. Um, we have a limit on the size of our reticles. Um, so TSMC provides this uh, um, technology called COOS, where you can see what they can do with it. You can look on their website to see how it's done. Other companies also provide it too. It's a relatively new technology, and uh, so it's a lot more expensive, but it's been in early production since 2011, and it's much simpler than um, 3D technology where you actually take two chips and just use these uh, uh, different types of TSVs and so forth and try to put them on each other. Um, the heat removal and power delivery are almost the same as in MCM. So that's really, uh, uh, it's really what's done on high-end chips nowadays. HBM or high bandwidth memory is probably the main application that's already being used today. So memory is obviously the the big uh, the big uh, wall and the big bottleneck for for high uh, performance systems, <coughs> and especially things like GPUs. They need tons and tons of memory, or networking chips and so forth need a ton of memory. So high bandwidth memory is this uh, standard. It's one of a bunch of standards that have come out. Um, the, the, how you connect an SOC to DRAMs and you can see here um, that we put our SOC over here and then through this silicon interposer we put a stack of 
uh, 3D connected DRAM slices that are on top of each other and we can get really high performance. You can see here um, there are two cores of uh, memory, four cores of memory, eight cores of memory. Um, and there are different configurations here that show you how you get these really, really high bandwidths to go to um, uh, the DDR of the chip. So um, with that, I finish uh, my discussion of IOs, and I really want to thank Ido Burstein from Mellanox, who um, provided a lot of the, uh, the background slides for the final system and packaging uh, part. Okay, thank you.